only to plant, and therefore you can't use it to replicate or reproduce. So these are the dilemmas the U.S. Supreme Court faces, and the, these nine to nothing decisions by the court make me think of uh, the rule in the ancient biblical Sanhedrin court uh, that all decisions that were unanimously agreed upon were automatically re-argued because if something was so important to get to the court in the first place, there should be someone who disagrees with, with the decision. So this is where the U.S. Supreme Court is. It has become the dominant player, far more than the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. It has granted, just granted, four new grants uh, of, of IP cases, including two significant patent cases and certiorari, on, on including especially contributory uh, infringement. It has before it two critical cases determining fee shifting, uh, when cases are exceptional that lead to fee shifting. And so the, the message here is that the U.S. Supreme Court, based on its own conflict between notions of invention and investment, with significant input from non-patent actors, is now the dominant source of U.S. intellectual property law. And this tension will play itself out, and we will see it in the future again and again. We'll see it to give you a preview of next year. The Supreme Court has just granted certiorari in the CLS Bank case, which is the fundamental issue that split the Federal Circuit over the extent to which software can be patented. And so sometime by the end of the next session of the Court, we will have the U.S. Supreme Court's answer to that. Based on what they've done, my own prediction, which is often wrong, but I will make it, is that they will severely restrict the ability to software patent in the CLS case. But that's what's happened in American patent law. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit is still there, but the U.S. Supreme Court is now effectively, not just in name but reality, the Supreme Court for patent law in the United States. Thank you very much.